turn to Acts chapter 13 and start to look at, well, not an ideal church, but a wonderful picture of a first century Christian community. And I want to pick out five signs of a healthy church. Okay, let's go to Acts 13. Here we go. Five signs of a healthy church. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. There you go. There's a few more bits where Antioch comes into the story, but this is our introduction to a fellowship that became one of the great centers of Christianity. In fact, it was the place where people were first called Christians, followers of Christ. And this little three verse vignette suggests a few reasons why. What makes or what keeps your church healthy? Number one, there's a diversity about the people there. Sometimes we act as if every church should look and act the same. And this comes to the fore with our growing media connectivity, with every young youth band trying to sound like all the others, an emphasis on an emphasis on ministry, on music and outreach that somehow all looks the same. It's as if church has become X factor and we're desperate to compete. But here, here, well, we might assume that churches should really have one senior leader. We call that leader the pastor or something. But at Antioch, it sounds like that person might have been Barnabas at one stage because he was drafted in from Jerusalem to supervise a season of rapid growth. But in this passage, we read how after prayer, he's sent out from the church on mission. So not him then. So you're left to deduce that second point. There's a plurality of leaders with different areas of gifting. How interesting. And this may be the implication of the phrase in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. That means there was a group of people who brought direction and doctrine, prophets and teachers. The giving of prophecy doesn't just mean something that is specifically individualized and given to one person like a magic recipe about the will of God. No, no, it's much more organic than that, much more community based. It's for the building up of the, the body, not the celebration of the individual. So there's a group of people here who were allowed to call leaders and they were designated as prophets and teachers, direction and doctrine. Presumably they were teaching from what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible possibly in the way that the letter to the Hebrews is a discourse on aspects of the Old Testament history and theology and centering that exposition on the work of Christ. It's like Christ becomes the, the, the point to which all the doctrines of the Old Testament are directed. The confluence point, the convergence point. And so we see what first century Christian teachers might have been doing. Is that what they were doing at Antioch? There's another area of the diversity, which is really interesting. And you can't read too much into a list of names, but the list is certainly intriguing. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So we are entitled to read a kind of racial mix, an ethnic, I mean, linguist, linguistic, and a class diversity that is really intriguing. 
Barnabas, okay, we know he's from Cyprus, but he's a Jew who lives in the diaspora, a Jew who's brought up outside of Israel. Simeon called Niger. Okay, well, that's where we get the word Nigeria from, from, from the river Niger. Okay, and the word meaning black, we have a black African. We have, so it's Jewish African. Then we have Manain, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. This is at the very top level of society. This is your aristocratic elite, Jewish elite. How interesting. And then we have Saul, who is another diaspora Jew from what we call southern Turkey. So you've got Jewish, African, Greek, Gentile, upper class, educated. These constitute the leadership group. So did the ethnic mix of this leadership group describe or parallel the demographic mix of the local population at Antioch? You might also ask the question, does yours, does your leadership group, does it parallel, does it echo, does it show what people around here look like okay and third we have to use the word charismatic here and obviously that's not a denominational descriptor but an appropriate term for a group that is animated and directed by the holy spirit this church was charismatic in the full sense operating in the gifts of the spirit in a unity of purpose and seeking direction through prayer and fasting asking the Lord to direct how they direct mission. And fourth, you notice the centrality of worship here. Think of the intentionality expressed by that word fasting, fasting, which Eugene Peterson in his masterful exposition or um, <laughs> paraphrase the message, called appetite denying discipline so that we're prepared to engage in appetite denying discipline of fasting in order to find out where god was directing them so they were charismatic small c in in that full sense of listening to the voice of the holy spirit and being ready to move on it and at the heart of it was a desire to worship and an openness to the prophetic voice. Do you remember in Isaiah 30, the, the, the prophets uh, said centuries before, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. So the church is operating on that very precept, precept, but carefully, prayerfully, and within the context of worship and fasting. This is what the church looked like. Okay, think of it again. So it is diverse. There's a diversity, keeping it healthy and fresh with lots of different ethnic, racial, class groups, keeping it alive. It has a plurality of leadership. So it's not just dumbed down into one person dominating the show. It has a fascinating diversity, and it is definitely charismatic. It is open to the voice and the flow of the Holy Spirit. It is ready to come together in fasting and worship. Worship is central. Mission is central. It's central. Its mission is the main thing. That's what the church at Antioch looked like. That's what kept it healthy. That's what made it vibrant. And think about why Luke constructed this passage. He's getting us ready for the new push into God's kingdom extension in the work predominantly of Paul, Saul, who became Paul. But he's showing us He's showing us that where there is a vital spirit led church, it will always be focused on mission. Emil Brunner said the church exists by mission as a fire exists by burning. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's what we do. 
we go, <laughs> we speak, we are salt and light. We're not held back within a salt cellar or within a battery. We are operating, functioning, spreading, penetrating the world and pointing to signs of God. So here's the fifth hallmark of the church at Antioch. It was missional. These are things that are not little departments over here that come into focus and then go out again. These are the ethos of the whole church together. This is what how its health was maintained. Here's a lovely quote from Chris Wright. Here we go. The whole Bible is itself a missional phenomenon. The writings that now comprise our Bible are themselves the products of and witness to the mission of God. The Bible renders to us the story of God's mission through God's people in their engagement with God's world for the sake of the whole of God's creation. The Bible is the drama of this God of purpose engaged in the mission of achieving that purpose universally, embracing past, present and future, Israel and the nations, life, the universe and everything. And with its center, its focus, its climax and its completion in Jesus the Christ. The mission is not just one of a list of things that the Bible happens to talk about only a bit more urgently than some mission is in that much abused phrase what it's all about i'm me meeting this pastor one time and he was so animated with this you might say ideology of church that he taught his young people he had a group i think it would be about 30 young people 30 young people young young adults and he motivated them and he energized them and he taught them what mission meant. And it became the central focus. He pulled me in to help him teach his, I was pastoring a nearby church. He brought me in to teach his church. And the, the mission was not just a department. It was the whole deal of everything. And they all went, they all left on mission, all of them, 30 great young folk, I've been lecturing on the Gospel of John, and they all left on different missions worldwide, and he equipped them, he encouraged them, he even paid for some of them, and they left. And the local church fell apart, more or less, because they had provided the, the guts, the engine of the whole enterprise, and now they were gone. So here's the question, was he right or was he wrong? My only answer, my own answer is that he was only wrong if you determine the success of a local church by its longevity or by its number. But if you measure success by different categories, like the investment into an unknown future of which Jesus alone is Lord, then you, you can't really say that different things are happening. Could it have been that the Holy Spirit instructed the church at Antioch to send their most capable leaders away on mission. If we are to impact our world, Alan Hirsch, in the name of Jesus, it will be because people like you and me took action in the power of the spirit. Ever since the mission and ministry of Jesus, God has never stopped calling for a movement of little Jesuses to follow him into the world and unleash the remarkable redemptive genius that lies in this very message we carry. And given the situation of the church in the West, much will now depend on whether we're willing to break out of a stifling herd instinct and find God again in the context of the advancing kingdom of God. Praise God. Five signs of a healthy church, but at the heart of it is in the understanding that how we live and act is wrapped up in the call to mission and our response to that call. Amen. Lord, we pray. We allow your Bible to have a space in our brain for a moment or two. We pray that you speak to us, not that we look negatively on our own experience, but that we challenge to look 
on the story that you're telling us, on the way that you're leading us, on the future that you're opening in front of us. We pray, Lord, that we may live our lives to your glory together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you today.